we are back um, continuing our look at chapter 11 on the digestive system. This is part number two. So last we left and we finalized part number one, we talked about the fact that digestive systems can often have specialized compartments, um, the specific flow as food moves through our GI tract. Um, we also talked definitely about the different enzymes and the difference between mechanical and chemical breakdown. So what I want to do is I want to continue our trend and let's start taking a look at things like salivary glands as well as how the nervous system um, plays a role in controlling movement of food from point A to point B through our uh, digestive system. Now, saliva is a very important component of the digestive system because what saliva tends to do is not only does it tend to wet or lubricate the food, it also tends to make it easier to kind of spread it apart into its bolus form. And as it becomes wet, what we see happening is that it allows it to interact with the different um, gustation receptors that we have on our tongue so that we can actually taste the food that we're consuming. We also see that saliva, which is mostly water and is a neutral solution, will also have a mixture of different enzymes in it. So for instance, we talked about the salivary amylase and the lipase um, that's found in the mouth due to uh, courtesy of the saliva. We also know that it has antimicrobial effects into it. So if you've ever heard of the five second rule um, it turns out there is some truth in that because within your saliva you do have some antibodies and you also have some lysozymes that are specific in breaking down any type of microbial particles that you might have accidentally consumed in the food that you're chewing on. Now, your saliva comes courtesy of a combination of intrinsic and extrinsic glands. The majority of them are being secreted by the three extrinsic glands that are highlighted on the picture on the right-hand side. You can see that you have your parotid gland, um, you have your mandibular gland, and you have your sublingual gland. The sublingual gland um, is located right underneath the tongue. The mandibular gland is more towards the end of the oral cavity. Um, and then the parotid gland tends to be located more towards the temporal side of the head. So it tends to be close to the, um, the ear cavity. Now, these three glands will collectively produce the majority of the saliva that you require. And the intrinsic ones are going to be a collection of smaller cells that produce small amounts of saliva as well every day. Now, it turns out that your body can produce different saliva depending on what actually stimulates the secretion. So at the bottom of your PowerPoint, I wrote down, I said salivation is controlled by nerve signals and we can have our parasympathetic or our sympathetic nervous system that come and initiate the production of the saliva. What's the difference? Well, the parasympathetic uh, nerve signaling is going to produce a saliva that is more watery. It's going to be full of digestive enzymes. This is the saliva that you uh, produce when you see food, you think about food, you start chewing food. It's all about the breakdown of food. Whereas the, par uh, the sympathetic nervous system, the one that gets you all hyped up, um, that one, when it produces saliva, that saliva is full of mucus. And usually what we see is it tends to dry out the mouth, so you get that little cotton mouth feel. Um, so some of you might have it if you have to do like public speaking and you don't like it, or when you kind of are a little nervous and you have to explain yourself and you find that your mouth all of a sudden goes very dry. That is all due to the sympathetic nervous system stimulating the saliva that's so full of mucus, drying it out. Now the stomach. The stomach for us is going to be our most acidic component of our digestive system. And what we see happening here is that there are a collection of different cells that will come into play to not only keep the stomach completely separate from the rest of the body, but also prevent it from breaking down itself due to the high acidity that it has uh, stored within its lumen. So go ahead and take a look at some of the cells that are mentioned on the left-hand side. And what we see happening is that the stomach, which tends to have lots of columnar epithelium cells, these cells will be merged together by what we call tight junctions, which are impermeable junctions. So that's an excellent way to prevent any acidity from leaking out of the stomach. We also see that lining the lumen of the stomach, you will have lots of mucous neck cells. These are important because they're going to secrete an extra thick layer of mucus, preventing the acids from kind of leaking through the individual cells.
We also see that you have parietal cells. Parietal cells are essential to the function of the stomach because they will be the ones that will secrete the hydrochloric acid, which is what lowers the pH. The stomach also produces some enzymes, including protease pepsin. Um, these are done by our chief cells. Now, the chief cells will go ahead and secrete the proenzyme, uh, meaning it's not in its fully functioning form yet. But when it's exposed to the hydrochloric acid solution inside the stomach, then the pepsin will become fully activated. We also know that there are some enteroendocrine cells. Um, these are going to be secreting different hormones, like for instance, gastrin, um, and then they will basically help regulate the movement of the stomach, as well as when it's time for the chyme to leave the acidic environment and pass through the pyloric sphincter, making its way over to the small intestines. Now, a few things I want to mention about the stomach. Um, the first one is, is that not all animals will always utilize um, the acidity in the stomach, meaning it doesn't always have to be um, at a low pH. And an example of that is the insertion of the little frog that I have on top of your PowerPoint. That is the gastric brooding frog. And what's cool about this particular species of frog is that when their eggs become fertilized, so let me just back up a little bit. Uh, frogs do external fertilization, which means that after sex, they release the egg and the sperm on the outside environment. Usually it's near a water source. And what we see happening with the gastric brooding frogs is that when the eggs become fertilized externally, um, the frog will actually swallow these fertilized eggs and let them sit in the stomach where they will continue to gestate and eventually develop. And it turns out that the stomach will not be acidic obviously at that time because that will kill off the fertilized eggs. Instead what we see happening is that high levels of uh, prostaglandin will be secreted and that will actually inhibit acid buildup within the stomach. So it stays a nice neutral environment while the eggs continue to develop and as the eggs start to hatch open what we see happening is what the insertion is showing us is that literally the young will hop out of the stomach out of the oral cavity of the frog. I'm sorry, I think this is just one of those amazing things that nature does. And um, I have a natural fear of frogs, I can't explain it. I would definitely not want to have one of these frogs stare me down, open their mouth, and out jumps even more frogs. <laughs> Seems like the worst nightmare scenario. Anyway, I digress. Um, another thing I want to point out about the stomach is oftentimes when we are doing face-to-face -face classes, um, I always get the question of, do we really need a stomach to survive? What happens if you don't have a stomach? Well, it turns out that the stomach doesn't really serve any type of um, absorption or digestive function within our GI tract. I know a lot of people think that the stomach does most of the work, but it really doesn't. Your small intestines do the bulk of the work. Your stomach, you can really just consider it a muscular sac that is used for storage, and it allows the food, um, the chyme, to sit in its acidity while it waits its turn to move down the small intestines, where actually most of the work of absorption and digestion will occur. So you can completely live without a stomach. However, you would have to adjust your food pattern because you won't be able to consume large meals in one sitting because you lose that storage unit. So you would have to consume small meals and you would have to chew a lot more to make sure that the food can literally slide from the esophagus into the small intestines. I also want to point out that there is this one thing that the stomach produces. Um, it's called intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is essential for us to be able to absorb B12 um, from our GI tract into our bloodstream. B12 is a very important vitamin because it helps us with our DNA replication, red blood cell uh, formation, very essential. So people who um, have to remove their stomach, like for instance, there's been cases where um, there was cancer that develops in the stomach. Some of them can be very aggressive, so the patient will elect to have their stomach removed. Um, in that case, what we see happening is that those patients, because they're no longer producing intrinsic factor, either have to get a shot of B12, so it's introduced into the bloodstream right away, or they're encouraged to take their B12 supplements right underneath the tongue, where there's very thin tissue that leads to lots of blood vessels, and they're able to meet their um, vitamin requirement that way. And because the stomach is a muscular sac, that does mean that it can stretch 
out. So the reason I bring this up is because when patients go and they have, for instance, gastric bypass surgery, part of what they do is they basically section off a large part of the stomach. So the stomach is severely reduced in size. Therefore, the patient has to adjust how much they're eating. And if they eat too much, they get very nauseous and they'll throw it up. However, what we see happening is that if the patient starts increasing their portion size over time, the stomach will stretch out very similar to if you compare to the size of your stomach when it was when you were nice and young right when you were a baby when you were a little kid versus the size of your stomach now it stretches as we consume more and more food so over time what we see happening is that gastric bypass will give you a quick result of weight loss however it's very hard to maintain that weight loss because as you start consuming more food over time your stomach will increase in size again allowing you to overeat those calories which obviously can lead to weight gain. The last thing I want to bring up about the stomach is related to the statement that I have over here, Helibacter pylori. This is a bacterial uh, strain that loves to hang out by the stomach and the little esophageal sphincter. And what we see happening is if patients come in and they consistently complain about having um, heartburn and they're taking over-the-counter products like Pepto-Bismol and they're not getting any results, oftentimes it's recommended that they'll test for the presence of this bacteria because the Helibacter pylori, if it's persistent, will cause lots of um, heartburn to occur, but it can also increase the chances of your patient developing gastric ulcers. And Pepto-Bismol will not solve this issue in case some antibiotics will be required to obviously kill off the bacteria and therefore you can switch over to Pepto-Bismol. Pepto-Bismol is really just kind of just like a pink liquid band-aid that will go over the um, lumen of the GI tract and it will kind of, you know, prevent some of the blood vessels that are being exposed because they've been aggravated um, so that your body can have time to kind of heal up that section. Pepto-Bismol is not good for Helobacter pylori because like I said to you before, it doesn't do anything. It, you need some antibiotics to kill it off. All right, now let's go to the actual workhorse of your digestive system. And those are gonna be the small intestines, okay? This is where the majority of your digestion is going to occur, as well as your absorption. We see that the intestines have four main layers that they're composed of. Um, you have your mucosa, you have your submucosa, your submucosa is where you're not only going to have all your blood and lymphatic vessels, you're also going to have lots of duodenum or Brunner glands that are going to help you with your mucus secretion. They are going to be very important in just a few seconds. We also see that they have different levels of smooth muscle. You have the circular muscle, which can control the size of the little segments. Um, it can also control the size of the lumen, right, opening and closing it, uh, making it easier for the enzymes to mix with the food that they're exposed to. You have longitudinal smooth muscle, which will run the entire length of the intestines, and we're going to use that, in essence, to keep the food particles moving down the GI tract. Um, within the small intestines, as I mentioned to you in part one, you have three sections, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ilium. Please know what each of them contributes to your GI tract. So the duodenum or the duodenum, that is going to be the first part of the small intestines. This is the part that comes into contact with the pyloric sphincter, which is the valve that regulates the acidic chime from the stomach into the neutral environment of the duodenum. And what the duodenum needs to do is it needs to neutralize this acidic chime. So it is going to be utilizing those duodenum glands, which are also called Brunner glands, B R U N I A A N E R. And these Brunner glands and duodenum glands are going to secrete high levels of mucus, and that's where we're going to use to neutralize the chyme. The second part of the small intestines is called the jejunum, and the jejunum is where most of your nutrient digestion and absorption is going to occur. 
So this is an essential part of your um, digestive tract. And then the last part is going to be where your ileum is going to be called your ileum. Your ileum is going to be known for the fact that it's going to be filled with pyrus patches. Pyrus patches are nodules with white blood cells stuffed into them. So they will play a role in your immune system and regulating any type of abnormalities like bacterial or viral particles that still might be in the food at this point in your GI tract. Um, there are different types of cells that will help the intestines fully function. So as I mentioned to you before, if your food is fully broken down into a monomer, it's now time to actually absorb it into the bloodstream. So your enterocyte cells will help with that. They will increase their surface area by having different microfilli that will allow them to maximize the contact that they make with the monomers. You will have lots of mucus, courtesy of the goblet cells. Mucus will not only help you with your neutralization, but mucus is also an excellent way to keep items kind of moving and lubricating areas so it makes it easier um, for the food to pass through the entirety of your intestines. You will have some enteroendocrine cells. These will secrete different hormones. Part of the hormones will um, go ahead and send signals down to the large intestines to make them aware that food is coming its way. So what we see happening is that the large intestines will start initiating what we call a mass movement, meaning you start to get the sensation that you have to go and you have to go poop, right? You have to drop your fecal matter. You need to empty it out because more food is coming. This kind of explains why for most people, um, about 30 to 40 minutes after consuming a large meal, we have the sensation that we have to go to the bathroom. Um, and that's basically your rectum telling you we need to empty it out because more food is heading our way. And then the last one are the panit cells. These are going to secrete antimicrobial molecules. They are found in the little crypts. Um, those are very similar to the pyrus patches that I was mentioning to you before um, that you can find in your ileum. So don't jump in, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. There are also some what we call accessory organs that will kind of loop into our GI tract that are very essential. Definitely the pancreas and the liver are the two that we have to mention. So what we see happening is that the pancreas um, will produce a lot of the enzymes, and we will mention that again in a little bit, but I just realized that the PowerPoint we were looking at, my apologies, is that of the liver first. So the first one right here is for the liver. Now the liver we're going to talk about because they're individual cells the hepatocytes will produce bile and hopefully by now you're familiar with the fact that bile is going to be our emulsifying agent it's going to allow us to interchange the lipids with the water and her hydrolysis component and the bile is produced by the hepatocytes and then it's stored in the gallbladder the gallbladder sits right here it's a little pouch and as you can see from the illustration both the liver and the gallbladder are able to secrete bile through the bile duct into the top part of the small intestines right here by the duodenum and as you can see it feeds into our GI tract so that's why it's considered an accessory organ and it's an exocrine secretion because obviously it travels through a duct and it then goes into the opening which is the top part of your small intestines. On the side right here, it highlights the fact that we have our bile salts that will help us emulsify our fats, and then we also we have our phospholipids in our bile. That will help us with the uptake of our lipids, whether it's going to be in the bloodstream or it's going to be within our lymphatic system. Okay, so here are my, here's the pancreas. Now, the pancreas is a primary, a, a good example of what we like to call a mixed gland. Many of us, when we hear the pancreas, we think about insulin, um, and you're completely correct in that. That is the hormonal secretion of the pancreas. That is going to be its endocrine aspect. But the majority of the pancreas is composed of what we call a senior cells, and a senior cells are going to be producing our digestive enzymes. These senior cells have the ability to produce enzymes that can help us break down carbohydrates, lipids, nucleotides, as well as proteins. And what we see happening in an illustration right over here is we see our pancreatic duct making contact with the duodenum, the top part of the small intestines, because once again, what we see happening is that we're going to have to introduce 
new enzymes as the environment switches from acidity to neutral. So these enzymes all function best in a neutral environment, which is the small intestines. And something interesting to point out is that when the pancreas produces their proteases, which are the enzymes that break down proteins, it actually will go ahead and secrete them into duodenum in an inactive form. So the enzymes right here, when you look at their names, notice how they either have a pro or they have the nogan at the end. And that indicates that they are not active. So there's kind of like a pro-enzyme. The reason that they're secreted in pro-enzyme form is because the pancreas itself is composed of lots of proteins. And we don't want these enzymes to start breaking down the protein of the pancreas. So we don't want that to happen. So instead, what we see happening is we secrete it in its inactive form. When it enters the duodenum, it has to interact with this little brush border enzyme that we see right here, the membrane-borne enterokinesis. This brush border enzyme will then go ahead and squeeze off. You can see it's doing it with the trypsin. It will go ahead and activate the proenzyme into its active form, allowing for a cascading reaction to occur. And at the end of the day, what we see happening is very quickly after entering the duodenum, all the protease enzymes are fully active. So the pancreas secretes it in proenzyme form, and then the brush border enzyme will go ahead and activate it as it slides by. In addition to the proteases, remember that we also have pancreatic amylase that's being secreted by the pancreas that will help us with our carbohydrate breakdown. We also have our pancreatic lipase that will come courtesy of the pancreas that will help break down all our different triglycerides and lipids. And then one thing that I really hadn't mentioned that much is the fact that you do have nucleases. Nucleases are enzymes that can break down DNA and RNA. All of the animal and plant-based products that we consume, they obviously also have DNA and RNA. So our body will use the nuclease enzymes to break them down into like the nucleotides, like adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, so that we can recycle those. And that's not really for nutritional demand, so that's why I hadn't really mentioned it, besides, you know, uh, the importance of like the protease, the carbohydrates, and the lipase enzymes. All right. Now, the movement through our GI tract, um, we see, tends to be controlled by a combination of nerve signals as well as hormonal signals. And the nerve signals will also come into play in the fact that we have our enteric nervous system, which we've discussed in a previous chapter. That's going to be the collection of nerves that are solely going to be focusing on movement of food within the digestive tract. Um, movement of food from the esophagus into the stomach, into our intestines, can be fully independent from the rest of the body because of the enteric nervous system. So what I want to do now is let's go ahead and take a look at a few slides. Let's explore some of the different hormones, some of the different nerve signals that we rely on to basically increase the effectiveness of our digestive system. So let's start with control of appetite. Um, there are three hormones that have been extensively studied because they all seem to have a control over our need for hunger or appetite. And they basically rely on receptors that you find in your hypothalamus. The first one is leptin. This one tends to have more of a long-term control over your appetite. Um, usually what we see happening or the mechanism of action is controlled by the amount of white adipose tissue that you have. So that's the adipose tissue that comes from excessive eating um, compared to brown adipose tissue, which is more about heat regulation. So white adipose tissue, what we see happening is um, it secretes leptin. And what your hypothalamus does is it maintains kind of like a ratio of how much adipose tissue you have. And if it sees that you have excessive white adipose tissue because it's secreting, it's responding to more and more leptin, we see that it goes ahead and it sends a signal to suppress the appetite. And in fact, there's studies been done that some people who are overweight, that there might be a genetic basis to it because either their body is not secreting leptin or they don't have the receptors on the hypothalamus that can recognize the leptin. So at the bottom or on the side, you're going to see two animals, two little rats, and you can see one is significantly larger than another. And I, was, I took this picture from a trial where they went ahead and they um, obliterated the receptors in the hypothalamus 
for leptin. And what we saw is that in the wild sample, meaning the sample that was completely normal, the rat would stop eating when they was full and would start eating less if they saw that it gained some additional weight. Whereas our friend over here, who's so pleasantly plump, Unfortunately, he didn't have any receptors to recognize the leptin, so he had no control over his appetite. So there does seem to be a genetic link about self-control and overeating. Um, another hormone that's been studied is the gremlin. This one is actually secreted by the stomach whenever it's empty, and it cur comes courtesy of the gastric cells that you find in your stomach. And it is a short-term control over appetite because it will go ahead and start stimulating appetite. And part of what it does is it does go ahead and increase the churning of the stomach. So if you've ever sat there and you have that awkward uh, sound that your body will make when you're really hungry, this is partly to thank to this particular hormone. And then peptide YY is done by the um, enteroendocrine cells, which you find in your colon. They will go ahead and uh, also have a short-term control over appetite, but they are meant to suppress your appetite. And the reason they suppress your appetite is because they signal the fact that you still have a food or partially a food that's being compacted for expulsion. You still have it in the colon, so the colon is not empty. It's still actively working off your last meal, so it doesn't have room to accommodate any new food at this time. Now, in addition to your hormones, we also see that the hypothalamus itself can secrete different neurotransmitters um, that can help you respond to the hormones that are being secreted by the, um, by the gut. And by the way, on top, I kind of adjusted the title. I said these can help you with the control of your appetite versus hyperphagy. Hyperphagy is the act of overeating. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, there tends to be a genetic link to it sometimes due to the improper response respond of your body to leptin. Um, I also want to point out some neurotransmitters that have been shown to either stimulate or inhibit appetite. Um, so one of them is, for instance, the neuropeptide, the GABA, those tend to stimulate, where the ones that tend to inhibit are kind of like your POMC neurotransmitter. And as you can see on the side right here, um, using the plus and the negative, it shows how these neurotransmitters can interact with different sections of your digestive system. Now, how do we actually control movement of food down the gut, right? And what we see happening is that for the majority of the time, we're going to use this thing called peristaltic motion. Peristaltic motion is this wave-like continuous motion of the smooth muscles, and it creates almost like this up and down action that allows the food to glide or propel from your esophagus all the way down to your stomach, into your intestines, and obviously all the way down to the rectum. We see that the actual speed that you're going to have these peristaltic motions will be controlled by a combination of nerves and hormones. Um, and it's important to kind of calculate what the optimal speed would be. And this will vary from animal to animal as, and also based on what the actual food is that they're consuming. So, for instance, you want to move the food at a rate that it's slow enough that you can extract the maximum amount of nutrients out of it, but also fast enough that if you have any type of um, waste products, that you can quickly get it out of the body because you don't want to carry excess weight around that's going to slow it down. Um, I guess a good example of that would be, for instance, in birds, what we see happening is that if you look at a lot of bird species, if they have the option of consuming fruit versus nectar, the, the speed of their gut will be different. So for instance, fruits tend to be heavy in the gut. So their digestive rate will be relatively fast because yes, they want to get the nutrients out of it, but they also want to get rid of any of the undested material, like the fibers that the food is holding onto. And part of that is because the food sits heavy and it might weigh down the bird, especially if it has to fly to its next location. On the other hand, nectar, that tends to have a slow speed through the gut because it is relatively light. So the bird will spend more time um, trying to extract nutrients and it's not in a rush to kind of get rid of it because it doesn't really contribute or affect the body mass significantly. 
Um, on the side of the PowerPoint, it just highlights again, once again, that within the smooth muscles of your digestive tract, you do have the ability to control the length meaning as it's gliding from beginning to end of your GI tract, but also the diameter. So that would be like your sphincters if you're controlling the size of the lumen. And part of that is going to be really nice because it's going to allow you to break down your GI tract in smaller little sections. And then that allows for better mixing with the enzymes that it's exposing to. And then here's your myenteric plexus that I was telling you about. Um, these will be part of your enteric nervous system that will help you control movement um, through your GI tract. And obviously, you will get input from both your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. All right, so here's just another look at the peristaltic motion. Like I said, just contractile waves that'll help you move down your GI tract. Um, they're controlled by intrinsic myogenic activity, and this is because a lot of these cells, such as our interstitial cells of the gallate, they will have um, lots of pacemaker cells. Now, we've seen pacemaker cells before, right? That means that they will tend to spontaneously depolarize. They will be the collection of the cells that will initiate the contraction so that everything else will respond to it as well. Um, we also see that we have something called the resting muscle tone, and that basically means that um, we have to have a way to control the lumen diameter as well as regulation of your intrinsic pathway, um, <coughs> whether food is in the system or not. So, for instance, this will play a role in the consistent coiling up of our small intestines, keeping everything packed within our abdominal muscle. So on the side right there, you could see your circulatory smooth muscle control, and you can see the myenteric plexus that are continuously communicating with the smooth muscle, sending different neurotransmitter, and obviously they can also receive input from the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system um, through secretions of things like epinephrine or epinephrine or acetylcholine. All right, so um, let's go ahead and as we try to finalize our chapter, let's take a look at some different animal models and how they regulate their metabolic action. So let's go ahead and start with our insects. Now, insects will go ahead and produce this hormone, whatever they need to do, um, a lot of our, our high energy demanding tasks, like for instance, flying, they will go ahead and secrete the um, adipokinetic hormone. And the debokinetic hormone is going to be secreted by the corpora cardica right over here in its nervous system setup. And it will go ahead and cause the release of fatty acids from a fat body because that is your main energy type of storage. And that's the end result. And you can see it happening right here with the fat body cell is that it will stimulate the breakdown of glycogen into triolose. Now, what does that all mean? That means that at the end of the day, it's going to help stimulate lipid breakdown. So this is a little bit different because in mammals such as ourselves, whenever we have um, the fact to have kind of like a high energy peak, what we see happening is that our body will start looking for things like glycogen um, or do gluconogenesis or glyconolysis, anything to give us glucose, right? Because glucose is our main form of utilizing it for our blood sugar so that we can do our cellular respiration and get ATP. Whereas when we look at insects, if they see that they have a high energy demand, instead of going after a carbohydrate or even like a monomer of the carbohydrate, like the glucose, they tend to go after lipids and use their lipids as a way to extract the energy demands from that, all due to the apetokinetic hormone. We also see that we have what we call the starvation response. Um, usually this means that if there is like a long-term deficiency of nutrients or no food at all, your body has to come up with a way to kind of figure out how to still meet all its energy demand. Um, part of that is because we want to make sure that things like our brain that don't require glucose will still have access, um, that don't require insulin, excuse me, will still have access to glucose and that the glucose won't be taken up by um, 
other insulin depending organs, like for instance, your skeletal muscle. So what we see happening is that if the body isn't exposed to fresh food sources, and even if the body is, for instance, in its fight or flight scenario, where we're just scavenging for additional energy supply, we see that your body, if it doesn't have any glucose, will go after either lipids or proteins as their basis for energy. Um, it tends to favor lipids first, and part of that is because your protein is what's going to compose a lot of your organs, um, as well as your skeletal muscle. However, if we see that you have um, secreted or utilized all your glucose and all of your lipids, and you're still not being fed fresh, quote-unquote, food or have fresh food intake, then your body will ultimately go and start breaking down um, your protein, starting with the skeletal muscle. So at this point, we literally see that the body is being broken down and wasted away, all in, a, uh, all in the sense to extract nutrients to keep the digestive system going. Now, how long does it actually take to get into a starvation response? Well, all of that will depend on um, the metabolic needs. It will also depend on the size of the organism. Um, so, for instance, the hummingbird, because of their high energy demand, because of the fact of how their flight pattern um, is so quickly, we usually see that even within an hour of not consuming any food, the body could start sending signalings for a starvation response. In humans, it usually it takes about 12 hours for the average person to start noticing any type of starvation response, meaning that you start getting the sensation of being hungry because your body is looking for uh, fresh sources of food to be introduced before it starts scavenging through its glucose and lipid um, supply. We also see that some animals have the ability to kind of degrade and rebuild their digestive system. Um, this is usually seen in animals that don't eat on a frequent pattern. Um, and part of that is because from an energy standpoint, it often makes more sense to rebuild than to maintain the consistency of the complex system. So for the example for this, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take a look at our python. And what we see happen with pythons is usually they tend to eat very infrequently and will, they will go ahead and degrade the mucosa and the submucosa of the digestive system in between meals. The gut will become thinner. The brush border will start to decrease. However, they will always maintain their smooth muscles and nerve cells. And what we see happening is that after a meal has been introduced into the oral cavity, the snake will go ahead and send hormonal signals that will cause the GI tract to start rebuilding. So as the bolus, the partially digestive food, passes down, it does encounter the specialized organs. So part of what you can do is you can go ahead and you can take a look at the bottom graph that shows you that after consuming a meal, how the weight of the organs start to increase because your body, uh, the body of the snake will now have a greater need for things like intestines because obviously there's a meal coming its way. The graph on top shows you how the size of the intestines will go ahead and spike and increase after the initial meal. And after the meal has passed through the snake, what we see happening is it slowly starts breaking down and this is part of all the system of the fact that it doesn't anticipate eating um, within the next, as you can see right here, 20 plus days. So it will go ahead and degrade the intestinal um, mucosa and submucosa, and it will rebuild it again whenever it's time for the next meal to be consumed. And then our last slide of our chapter talks about dormancy. So oftentimes there will be a time where hypometabolism needs to be activated, which means that you need to have a reduction in your metabolic rate. And this often correlates with the fact that the animal might be um, exposed to different environmental conditions where food might not be as available as it is during certain times of the year. Um, and this can be a short-term or a long-term type of defense. So for instance, um, there are three main types of hypometabolism. You have your torpor, which basically means that you have um, 
uh, physical or mental inactivity, usually lethargy, meaning slowing down of the process. Um, you can see this more on the short term. So for instance, with bats, when they are sleeping during the day, they like to put them in a torpor state where all their homeostatic purposes are moving at a much slower rate. Um, same thing goes for a lot of the birds. Um, hibernation tends to be more of an elongated process. Usually we'll see this in larger animals that they'll hibernate when their environment is very cold and there won't be enough food to go around. So instead of scavenging for food and spending all their energy on that, they'll go into hibernation. And an estivation is usually a response to um, high temperature or arid condition. This can also range from short term to long term. So it could be something as simple as that we can see some of the reptiles in the middle of summer. Instead of running around, they will find, you know, some rocks, some shadowy area to kind of hide under. And they'll kind of just sit there and they'll lower their overall activation energy all in a way to um, uh, conserve their energy. And this would then be an example of hypometabolism. With most of the dormant mammals, what we see is that the longer they maintain dormancy, they do start to accumulate urea um, and urine because the body continues to break down the protein that they have in their digestive tract. And in fact, for many of us in the morning, if we don't set our alarm clock, the reason we wake up is because we have the sensation that we have to urinate. And that's all due to the fact that the digestive system still continues to break down any type of food that was left over from, you know, the evening meal. Um, we do, I do want to point out that bears, some bears have this unique ability to kind of take the urea nitrogen, um, which they basically get from um, blood to the GI tract. They'll start degrading it and they're able to regenerate amino acids and proteins from it, which means that they're basically able to recycle their urea into usable amino acids and proteins. How cool is that? being able to do that biosynthesis. Um, so this is in essence one of the mechanisms why bears are able to hibernate for a much um, longer period due to the fact that they don't have that uh, dreaded urea demand on their bladder that they have to go ahead and excrete it. Alrighty, um, I think that's all I have for the digestive system. So I hope you guys enjoyed the chapter as much as I did. As always, if you have any questions, comments, and concerns, uh, please reach out or utilize the discussion sessions all up to you. And um, beyond that, this is our last chapter that will go towards exam three. So I do hope that you have plenty of notes, have fun studying, and then obviously if you need me, be sure to reach out. Thank you.